this is a very challenging time because there's both conflict and rapid disruption on the way with artificial intelligence. And what we're trying to examine here is how governments can prepare their societies for doing so uh, because there's a lot of misinformation. And Sebastian, you laid out this idea about an issue that's often overlooked, but at the World Economic Forum, where I saw you uh, in January, one of the top five threats for 2024 and 2025 was cybersecurity and cyber threats and misinformation. So how do you prepare your society to be aware of what's around the corner during an era of disruption? Do you want to start there? Yeah. First of all, thank you for inviting me. I think that um, we are living in times of change and challenging times, uh, probably starting with uh, the geopolitics. You mentioned at the beginning, I grew up in a uh, world um, of globalization, and um, now we have a totally different landscape from my perspective. We have a quite divided world. There are only a few places in the world, like here in the United Arab Emirates, where everybody is able to meet, but uh, the world has become very divided, and especially for us uh, Europeans, of course, the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine changed a lot. Second, uh, I think there are also new threats. I think we are all aligned that digitalization is very positive. Uh, um, it uh, changed the way how we work, how we interact, uh, uh, how we experience and learn. And this is, from my perspective, an extremely positive uh, development. But on the other hand, of course, it also um, creates new risks like cyber attacks. And if you uh, saw the director of the FBI, for example, a few days ago, he said the number one risk for the US is not a terror attack or a war or whatever, it's a cyber threat. Uh, and uh, if you look at um, the targets of uh, cyber terrorists, it's more and more not only companies, it's especially critical infrastructure that is in the, in the focus. And the last uh, issue you, you mentioned um, is, of course, the question how people get their information. And I think in the past, it was in a very traditional way. It was uh, through newspapers, um, media, classical media, which gave them a lot of power. But uh, on the other hand, it was also in a very controlled way. Uh, social media, um, I think, is a huge chance to get information. It's a huge chance for everybody to share information, um, to share your opinion. Uh, but of course, um, there is also uh, a new threat now, and this is disinformation. I think that um, if you have uh, the manipulation of pictures, for example, um, this is a threat, but if uh, uh, now videos are even manipulated, um, this uh, can be a real risk uh, to our societies, to our public debates, and of course uh, to, to uh, how people um, yeah, in get the information and inform themselves. Yeah, you laid out very central themes for the discussion as well. Uh, for a board seat that they were holding in Abu Dhabi, they asked if they could use my voice and still picture, and they did a 45-second board presentation opener, and I didn't do the voiceover, so just with the audio that it does exist outside the world, you would think I did the track. So yeah, to I mean, be, that's, that, that's the first stage to of To be this. honest, I think pictures and articles, of course, that was the first step. The next one was audio, and it's, 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 it's already pretty strong. But if you see a video of yours where you give a speech, to be honest, probably for everybody, it's something they easily can believe in. So. Um, from my perspective, this is, this is really um, a huge change and uh, a huge threat to, to yeah, how, how information can spread. Yeah, it was that ranked and number one on that uh, WEF sur uh, survey. Uh, Minister Papakos Santino, it's good to see you again. We had a chance to, to chat before, and I wanted to address what Professor Begg uh, made in his opening presentation. He's pretty optimistic, but I'm wondering if it has to get nastier before it gets better. And the other twist that you and I talked about over coffee was, I'm quite surprised how resilient the world is today. 
Uh, if you think about what it's been thrown with the pandemic preceding that with a financial crisis in a region with the Arab Spring, Russia, Ukraine, and energy shortage, they find solutions. But the combination of disruption and resilience, can it be sustained at this sort of pace that we're seeing today? George? First of all, ma many thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. I, I liked very much Ian's optimistic take, and I think we need to keep, uh, uh, at the end of the day, Two, two, two big lessons. One, yes, we find solutions, and this resilience is the second element. But having said that, I don't think we should be downplaying the enormous challenges that we're facing at the moment. I think there is one fundamental issue that sort of acts to, to, uh, as an umbrella for everything else, and this is that we are in a position of the greatest ever economic interdependence globally that we've ever had. At the same time, we are facing more fragmentation than we have ever faced. Mm. The geopolitics is absolutely terrible. Uh, there is weaponization of financial markets and of trade in global economic relations. And there's a real danger that uh, this creates conflict. And this creates conflict not just in areas such as trade and finance, where we've been seeing it. We've seen, for example, how the trade friction around China uh, are poisoning uh, international economic relations. We've seen how following the sanctions uh, around the Ukraine war, this has disrupted the international financial system. But there is a real danger that this kind of fragmentation that we're seeing spills over into other areas that are fundamental for humanity's well-being. Climate is, is a classic one. Uh, will we see the kind of fragmentation also spill into climate negotiations? We haven't yet. Health is another one. We've come out of, of a global pandemic where we surprised ourselves at our resilience. We were incredibly good at coming up with a vaccine. We were very bad at rolling this out around the world. But yes, we were resilient. But we are not seeing really learning the lessons from that pandemic. We're not seeing the World Health Organization being given the powers that it needs. So my, my big worry here, and I say this as an eternal optimist at the same time, is that there is this disconnect between the level of challenges that we're facing and the degree of interdependence that we are and the inability to come up with collective solutions and to cooperate internationally. This is a problem which I'm afraid is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, let me follow up on climate then, because I pr presented that to, to Ian as well. Uh, they fought very hard to get that final communique, uh, Dr. Sultan al Jaber, uh, and we have this orderly transition away from hydrocarbons. But the investment in renewables today is a trillion dollars. They need to triple it and they're trying to hit that target by 2030 and reduce emissions by half in that time frame. And they're trying to triple nuclear capacity by 2050. Sometimes I think we set unrealistic expectations, which then society feels that they have no control over. How would you manage this to, you know, if you could put a man on the moon and we're going to Mars today, why can't we collectively do a common good on climate, George? I think there's two positive elements and one disruptor here. The two positive elements are, one, we, as, we have seen that private uh, business has completely changed its attitude and uh, becoming green is now profit-making and they're investing massively and governments are following that. The second positive element is that civil society around the world and especially the, the younger generation, is very much uh, uh, into uh, climate change, into uh, the, the green transition, and is pushing everyone, government and, and business, to adapt. The disruptor has been uh, the fact that because of, of Ukraine, which has realized that the kind of, uh, the fuel that was the transition, which was gas, can no longer play that role. So we need to rethink. We need to redo the math, and the math involves some, uh, some uh, still adherence to the older uh, hydrocarbons. We've seen a number of places around the world sort of rethinking strategy. It, we need to rethink nuclear, which we had a number of countries in Europe, you know well, uh, Germany had taken out, for example, of the calculus. And we need to push much faster and make renewable cheaper, quicker. So it's a difficult equation to solve because the parameters keep changing and that but fundamentally, I think, even though we're behind where we should be, we're moving in the right direction. And if you allow, let, let me just ask, uh, let me just add two 
um, short points. First is, I think, of course, you're right that managing expectations is important, um, but I think there's also a need for big visions and, and, and goals where everybody can contribute. And second, um, I think that there is a lot of innovation. So what I especially liked at um, the, the COP was the strong involvement of the private sector. To be honest, from my perspective, this will be the biggest and the best driver in the next few years. The, the involvement of the private sector will drive innovation, and I think this will be the big game changer for me. Good. I'm glad you said that because there was a lot of criticism that there was too much business there. No, but they're the, one, the private sector has to put private capital up to make things happen, is what you're saying? Yeah, to be, to be honest, only having politicians to, to discuss and NGOs to criticize, this is not enough and it will not change anything. So from my perspective, the strongest driver is always the private sector. And um, the, the biggest change, uh, no matter in which area, can only, a disruptive change can only happen with innovation. Uh, and, and for that, you also need the private sector. So from my perspective, the, the strategy at the COP was absolutely right. And I think it was super successful. And uh, I think that um, yeah, the leadership of Dr. Sultan al Chaba and uh, also his team was, was phenomenal. I, I want to and dig in. Go one, ahead. Just yeah, one, one more point, because I think that, that Sebastian is making a very good point. What can governments do here? And that's important in that we are seeing climate finance uh, becoming much bigger than it used to. We're seeing international uh, institutions uh, funding uh, the green transition in a way they did not before, do before. So there is a shift in terms of how we treat the legacy assets, and that's very important, to make business, make it even more profitable for business to innovate and move faster. So there is a regulatory aspect of this transition. Business is moving by itself as well, but there is a regulatory uh, uh, connection that, that needs to be made. Okay, uh, there's an elephant in the room because we could have uh, Donald Trump back into power. And I talked about the unipolar world, that has definitely changed. We see the expansion of the BRICS, for example, and Russia, Ukraine getting China, somewhat India on the fence. Uh, the Middle East are trying to engage with Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the expansion of those BRICS. Uh, many people don't want to take sides and want to stay neutral, which makes perfect sense. But in the last 24 hours, one of his uh, advisors said that he'd like to come out of NATO, and he wasn't a supporter of the climate uh, agreement in Paris. So like many steps forward in COP28, you have a threat of going many steps back if the US pulls out. Can the world survive another term with Donald Trump? Let's go with you, Sebastian. So the world will always survive. Uh, I'm an optimist. And uh, to, to answer your question, I think nobody knows the the outcome of the of the elections in the in the U.S. yet, yeah. Um, so let's let's wait and see. Um, but what you mentioned before is is quite interesting. I think that the that the world has changed in a way that there's not only the West in the lead, yeah. Um, we we live in a totally different uh, world today. So uh, the U.S. and 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 Europe together are less than one, one billion uh, people. If you compare it with other world, parts of the world, that's nothing. If you look at where is a lot of growth happening, yeah, where is a lot of dynamic. You talked about um, efficient countries uh, before. I think Greece and Austria are small countries, uh, more efficient than others. Uh, I think that uh, the government of Mitsotakis is doing a phenomenal uh, job, but I think there are not many countries in the world you can compare to Singapore and Abu Dhabi. So the world is changing, um, and, and this, is, this is something which is not easy for the West, and especially for us Europeans. Yeah, in fact, the, the next century should be an Asian century if you just look at growth today. Uh, China's slowing down, but India's rising, and Southeast also, Asia's also rising. Also, if you look at uh, Africa demographics, rising. yeah, yes. it's, it's, it's uh, in... It's a, it's a question of efficiency. It's a question of, of course, how, how well countries are governed. Um, it's a question of innovation, but it's also a question of, of numbers when it comes to the, the, the numbers of societies. And, uh, and, and uh, there, I think, um, the demographic development is, 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 is very clear. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on modernizing 
post-World War II architectures. I, I, I want to have a quick reaction to your question. On Donald Trump. Yes. I was going to see if you wanted I can't to come back in. resist Thanks. the temptation, especially because, you know, no longer being in politics allows you to be, uh, you know, more free to speak about certain <laughs> things. So, Without my, being singled my, out the next morning as my, well. My right? quick reaction to that is that, uh, of course, every country uh, makes its decisions in, in, in elections, right? But the U.S. is a particular country, uh, given the dominance of the dollar in global economic transactions and given the U.S.'s geopolitical role. So I don't think that we can, you know, uh, uh, and if I understood Sebastian's uh, very careful answer, I think there is a concern there. And the concern is that, that we do not know what the next day is going to be in terms of global economic relations, in terms of the role of NATO, uh, and Europe needs to wake up to that, uh, in terms of uh, more transactional, uh, uh, a more transactional uh, uh, way of going about uh, international trade uh, and further frictions there. So yes, there is in terms of climate uh, and pulling out again of, of climate negotiations. So there are some pretty disturbing signs there which I hope will not be, uh, uh, we won't see them in practice. Good. Let, me, let me also add one Finish point. up, and let's see if we can get some questions. Go, go ahead, uh, uh, Sebastian. So, just put your hands up, because we only have three minutes left, so you, if you want to get the microphone, please. So just, just one sentence. I think, I think um, the, the, the main problem from a Western perspective is, is how the debate has changed in the US and in some, also some Western democracies like countries in, in Europe. So if you look at the, the US at the moment, it's a very di divided country. And I think this is, this is something which is, uh, which is the most problematic point because um, I think when I, I'm 37 now, but when I uh, became politically engaged um, and when I started to travel the world, I had the impression that, that many countries, many people in the world were looking towards the US and saw it as a role model. And I think if you travel the world now and ask people uh, in other places if the, uh, in the world now if they want to copycat that model, if they think it's still the role model, it's, if it's still that what they aim for, what they wish for, that has changed. And I think that's the, that's the main issue for me. Okay, that leads me to the final question for Professor Papacostantino. Um, the cradle of civilization is uh, Greece in terms of democracy and Western civilization. Is democracy overrated to Sebastian's point where people don't feel it's vital in the future of this era of disruption and they like continuity and they like a you know, five, 10, 50 year plan all mixed into one, which not at the whims of uh, elections. It's a big question, but what are your thoughts? It's a big question. You have one minute and 43 seconds to answer. We'll give you a little bit more uh, that, yeah? I, I'm a Greek and a European, and therefore I, I, I believe in liberal democracy as being the cradle of, of what we stand for. Uh, uh, so not just because, you know, I come from a country that, that invented the term. Uh, but democracy is in retreat uh, around the globe. Different countries interpret in different ways, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, there is a danger of, of uh, when it retreats uh, around the world and it poisons uh, international economic relations. Because again, I, I don't want to, to enter this question from a national standpoint. I want to enter this question in terms of what it implies for global cooperation around the kind of, of problems that we need to be addressing all together. Mm. And there is a clear connection there uh, that is problematic. So if you see democracy going back in the US, could be one such example, uh, uh, then we will not, no longer be able to solve the global problems that need uh, a collective understanding. Good. Take the one example, Sebastian, because you were a young leader, the youngest, I think, in history of, uh, of uh, Austria, which says something. The European Union, and some would argue it's an amazing expansion. It, after the fall of communism, which I had a chance to cover, Humpty Dumpty stayed glued together. But either modernization or growing a spine. I mean, many think that the European Union should be firmer, more cohesive, and ready to stand up to the challenge like Russia, Ukraine, without the US having to step in in a big way. Please. Well, I think the, the EU is a success model, and at the same time, there are some challenges. Um, so 
First, of course, when it comes to security, I think there's a need for a better cooperation within uh, the EU. Of course, most of the member states uh, of the European Union are members of NATO, but some, like Austria, are not. So from an Austrian perspective, my perspective, I think um, there's a need for a stronger cooperation when it comes to issues like security. Um, at the same time, I think um, that it would be good to have a European Union based on the principle of, of subsidiarity, because especially with the enlargement, now having 27 member states, probably even more in the future, um, I, 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 think, I think we, we still have to remember that it's not uh, like the United States. It's not one language and uh, a similar history. It's 27 different member states yeah, um, with different culture, different languages. Um, and so from, from my perspective, that would be, would be the, the, the right approach. Okay. I want to open the floor for just five minutes because we have a bit of breathing room. If there's any questions from the floor, we don't need to force it. But any questions from the floor? One here. If we can get a microphone. Can you stand up? We'll get a mic to you, please. And one other question if you want to. And one right here in the second row. And we'll just pass the mic to him. Just be very direct, please. Thanks. Good afternoon. My question goes to Mr. Sebastian Kurz. Uh, since we are talking about the world leaders and the politics, uh, I was wondering, uh, well, certainly there is no doubt that you, you became one of the uh, youngest world leaders in the world while serving as the Chancellor of Austria. And the question is, what you sacrificed to become the one uh, Chancellor uh, in what, the young age? Uh, and secondly, what was the question? Yeah, we didn't get the question. You have to be super clear. And just one question, please. What, sac what you sacrificed to become uh, sacrifice. youngest chancellor of Austria? Okay, interesting question. Thank you. What did you have to sacrifice, or was it a sacrifice? We've no, known each other for about five years. No, I'd love to hear your thoughts on no, this. No, it was. To be honest, it was not. I was. Uh, I was interested in politics at the, at the young age. Uh, started to get involved on a voluntary basis in a youth organization um, at the age of 17. And uh, uh, yeah, when I, when I went to university, I became more and more involved and uh, became the, the leader of, of our conservative youth organization in Austria. And I think then by accident entered the government at the age of, of 24, um, which was quite young. Um, so to be honest, um, of course, it was a lot of work, and uh, of course, it was a lot of responsibility, but um, I know many young people in the private sector or also in their private life as fathers or mothers um, who have a lot of responsibility. Um, so I think politics um, and, and the political arena should always be a mixture of different people. I think it's good to have... Uh, older people, younger people, people with more exp experience, people who are probably very fresh. Um, uh, you, you should have men and women, so I think diversity in, in the political arena is good. Good. Uh, very quickly, George, you learned it the hard way during the financial crisis. It's a pretty nasty game, is it not? Yes, my, my shorter answer is private life. You lose your private life completely. But, you know, at the, we have a word in, in Greek, which I'm sure, John, you know, which is hubris. Um, when you go through a d dramatic period, as, as I did in my country during, the, during our, our, our crisis, to say, oh, I wish I had not done this, is, is hubristic. I think that you're put in certain positions and you need to do the best and then uh, you know, feel good about what you've done and, uh, and live with your conscience. And I think that's very important. If at the end of the day you feel that you've done your best, then you did a good job. Good. We had a question here, and then we'll close out the session on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as many young people are also following us uh, online around the globe, it will be also interesting to know your opinions uh, to our panelists. What are the uh, future important values for the future leaders to have, especially when we are thinking about developing and shaping the future of the world? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It's excellent. <laughs> what sort of value systems do you have? Uh, there's a breakdown in religion in some parts of the West, for example. Nobody really identifies 
with a, a, a religious base, but what value systems should we be teaching? And in the West, we're not teaching civil service or civics anymore in, in the United States. It's kind of gone away. What do you think, Professor? All right, I'll start. I'm sure uh, Sebastian will have his own. I would use a few very simple words. Uh, I would start with empathy, uh, understanding, tolerance. We live in, in, in societies, a lot of them are broken. There's a lot of inequality, there's a lot of social tensions. So you need to be able, when you uh, go into politics or any leadership position, to understand that and work with it and work how to, to overcome it. Then, of course, the basic competence issues. Uh, but if you're talking about values, I think that's where you should be starting from. I totally agree, and I think probably the, the main thing is that if, if, if you, should, you should get involved in politics if you really like to serve your country. Yeah? If you want to serve the people in your country, then um, I think that's, that's uh, the, 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 the right starting point. Good. I lived here for 10 years, and the level of tolerance uh, with all the diversity you have here was I was pretty uh, astounded by. But I think in a post-pandemic world, I kind of simply went out of my way every time I take a train to reach out to somebody, or if somebody needs a seat, or if an elderly person needs a hand. And it sounds super simplistic, but I think we've lost that civility in many parts of the world because they're fighting inflation, which is hitting people in the pocketbook. They were cocooned for a couple of years because of the pandemic. Uh, and just taking pause to see that there's a human on the other side of the, of the train seat or wearing a mask that may be struggling, I think is a pretty good way to, to finish off here. Thanks for all the questions from the floor. We have one more session on climate and energy and the geopolitics around it. Uh, three superb guests, but can we give our round of applause to Sebastian Kurtz and George Papakos from the scene? Great to see you.